Uh, today, I will take up the subject of molecular engineering route for ceramics. You have seen through the past 32 lectures that I have repeatedly said that one of the biggest problems that we have of fabrication of ceramic shapes is at times our inability to control the microstructure, the surface morphology, which ultimately prevents us from properly engineering the ceramic for end use. When we are talking of large grain sizes, large particles, let us say particles which are larger than 1 micrometer, we compact them, we center them. Yes, we can control the morphology, the microstructure to a very large extent by a variety of processes. For example, my standard idea case is the housing of the sodium vapor lamps, which is alumina. Alumina, you think is white and non-transparent, but there through careful processing, we do get transparent aluminas from powdered alumina. However, as we scale down the sizes to lower and lower values, people use this fashion word nano. I had showed you earlier that real surface effects start happening only below 70 or 50 nanometers. That is where the surface energy is so high that the thermodynamics changes. It is not that we are involved in different thermodynamics, but the material can become more reactive. The biggest problem of using nano in ceramics has been that we may prepare 5, 10 nanometer powders. My students prepare these powders in the laboratory using simple beakers, no hi-fi stuff. In the lab, the undergraduate and the postgraduate students do, you do it. But when they try to center it, they run into problems. Either they suffer from uncontrolled grain growth or and or a lot of porosity remains. This is the reason why real people acknowledge that nano hydroxy apatites is ceramic. For example, the nano iron oxides which are used as colorants in say your lipstick or car paints, they are usable because they are being dispersed in a medium and there is no question of centering. It is that that these powders 5 to 10 nanometer sizes are being dispersed. But if we want to fabricate it, we run into a plethora of problems of uncontrolled grain growth and all of that. So, the goal has now turning to how to engineer the ceramics at a molecular level. Uh, 
If you happen to remember, long back, at the very early stages of my lecture, I had shown you a video where they had deposited hard coatings on contact lens, on, on the standard lens rather. If I can go back to that, uh, yeah, this is the video that you saw. In the last few years, we found that we can transfer these thin layers of uh, thin films or single layers of molecules from the water. onto uh, metal or glass plate. Langer's partner for the work on surface films was Dr. Catherine Blodgett. Together, their investigations produced films that would be used as non-reflective coatings for everything from camera lenses to eyeglasses. You'll see that the reflection is troublesome from the uncoated glass on this side, but it's not at all troublesome from this lens over as far as this line of demarcation. When I turn my head away from the light, both lenses appear the same. The research also yielded the announcement in November of 1932 that had been hinted at for five years. The Nobel Prize was awarded to Dr. Langmuir for his significant discoveries in surface chemistry, of oil films on water, and of properties of molecules one ten millionth of an inch thick. This was the first example how they were, these ceramic films were molecularly engineered. Why do I say it's, they were molecularly engineered? What is the key to this Langmuir Blodgett films? For that, if I look at this Wikipedia, uh, I accept the uh, license in terms of the creative commons of both the Wikipedia and YouTube and what it refers to is this Langmuir Blodgett film. The fundamental thing that they did with this film was basically they had a hydrophobic end and a hydrophilic end. There was a non-polar tail and a polar head. Now, you see, it is written over there, surfactant molecules. For example, when you wash your clothes, you add a detergent. What does the detergent do? The detergent is similarly designed. It has got a polar head and a non-polar tail. And as a result, these particles, they go and stick over here. And your cloth, clothes are washed because the dirt sticks on these detergent particles which have a non-polar head or a non-polar tail. You see, what Langmuir Blodgett did at that start, it is basically uh, what we call uh,
self assembled monolayer what was the fundamental of the two videos that i showed you all that he said was here is a bath i am dipping this whole thing and as i am pulling it out there is a coating developing on the surface essentially what either langmore or miss catherine blodget were saying here is water with these things all around i push a slide in down and when i pull it up as i pull the slide up what i see is that there the two sides are coated with these materials and this is basically the first example of self assembled monolayers now what i would say is you should uh there are two very very excellent references on youtube one is i'll give you time it's an hour long video so i won't show it but i would let it show so that you can copy the reference which is given over here if you look at this monolayer layer by layer assembly is an over an hour long lecture my net is slow so i have a problem this is one and the second one is this particular lecture which is again over an hour long is a part of it if you look at these two for more information visit umis.edu if you look at these two lectures i will you should have a very good example of how layer by layer growth occurs i'll go to that whole thing all over again so that you have time to copy the url this program is brought to you by the university of michigan for more information visit umis up oh, sorry 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 this program is brought to that this program is brought to okay. you by the university now you have seen both the youtubes and so i'll stop it these are very very large our lectures but this tells you how mono layers are generated layer by layer now the question is why am i so bothered with mono layer generation answer is these two diagrams it is again uh i won't be the i had to do this this is the microstructure of nacre or seashells this is what seashells are very 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 strong and for example that particular picture our bones they are a mixture of calcium hydroxy apatite in collagen nacre or seashells are very very strong and yet they are fundamentally 
calcium phosphates deposited layer by layer under the huge pressure of the sea water and you saw they had a perfect structure. Today, the work is on to generate synthetic bone using the same process. You see, a lot of people have made synthetic bones, but they were really synthetic in the sense they are either sintered alumina, sintered zirconia, some have developed sintered calcium hydroxyapatite, which is the basic bone material. But then when the sintered calcium hydroxyapatite, it does not remain in its original structure. In, whether it is alumina, zirconia, or calcium hydroxyapatite, which is sintered, it is just like any ceramic. It was liable to fracture under tensile load. Just imagine your leg. It's a long piece of leg bone measuring about 24 inches in a fully grown human. Or your femur bone about 18 inches in a fully grown human. Yes, replacements of such sections have been done, but they are all sintered and they have these replacements have been known to fail after implant that is while in service. To really, really, really replace these natural bones which we have with a real synthetic bone means we would have to replicate the bone structure. That is a layer of hydroxyapatite. Here is cheetosan or the polymer that binds the one. A layer of hydroxyapatite and again the cheetosan. It is not a sintered product. Yet, you have to understand the strength of the bone. As you walk, your whole weight falls on the heel. Now, calculate your body weight. Look at the load on the heel where it hits over one square inch area. And you will know that it is one of the most strongest materials known to man the other one being bamboo and we have not been able to fabricate any material which is either as strong as bone or as bamboo. They are the best engineered materials man knows and we are still striving to fabricate it. So, the research group which I showed whose diagram I showed to show you the structure of Nacher and others, they are trying to fabricate this self-assembled bone structure that is calcium hydroxyapatite, the cheetosan, calcium hydroxyapatite and have a layer by layer packing just as it exists in seashells. So, Fundamentally, what we are landing up with is we want this particular structure. It is this how to get it. And what we are today in ceramics trying to really do is we are trying to mimic nature. End of it. We know that these materials can only be synthesized if we copy it or try to develop it by the way the nature did it. However, we have one problem. 
a seashell takes decades to grow under the sea. We do not have the time. We have to accelerate it. And hence, we have to develop technologies that will help us mimic nature, copy or almost follow the nature's entire process to get a structure like say the human bone. It is not only the human bone that we are dealing with. I had talked to you very, very briefly on vapor deposition processes. There is a technologies that give you the basic Intel chip used in your computers, phones, whatever, those microprocessor devices. The difficulty is, as I had said earlier, is these are very, very high capital intensive equipment. And they are very, very energy intensive. Yes, with those technologies, we now have 32 nanometer lines. In a few years, a few years will go down to 16, maybe 8. But the problem that is coming in is just to have in those devices, if I want just a 32 or nm or a 16 nm trench which will carry the current, the amount of energy that we use is just stupendous. And the energy usage leads to formation of usage of electricity. Hence, greenhouse gas emissions, warming of the earth. So, for those of you who will be looking at these lectures in 2012-2013, I can assure you that in a decade's time from today, most of these current technologies will be outdated. In fact, many banned because they emit, they cause emission of so much of very large greenhouse gases or use so much of energy that the amount, overall amount is very high. The goal is now very well defined. That is, we have to grow this ceramics from the solution itself. The work started with Langmuir Blodgett, where they not only coated metal parts, glass slides, but the anti-reflective coating that Ms. Blodgett was using was a sintered LB film. It was just not a LB a glass coated with an LB film which would scratch off because it was just sticking to it by physical forces, Van der Waals forces or hydrogen bonds. That was a LB film which had been deposited in a glass and had been subsequently sintered to give it a hard, dense, anti-reflective coating. Now, that was 60 years ago, but the industry was not ready to pick up the challenge and bring it up to a commercial scale because that required a lot of things. But today, with bottom-up growth, 
that is growth from solutions taking the center stage large industry is now ready to invest large amounts of money so that the process of growth from the solution mimicking nature can now be really developed on an industrial scale. I had given you two links and I urge you again because they are available. They are University of Michigan lectures. They are very good. Please go through those lectures to understand the dynamics of layer by layer growth. In our effort to develop these structures, let us say one day what you will be, we will be depositing structures as per our dimensions, as per what we equally need. What we are now, I shall talk in this lecture about. Templated growth of ceramics. What do I mean? If this is a if this is my surface, this whole area, and I have areas where I intend say another oxide ceramic to be deposited at exactly these places and nowhere, nowhere over here, none of the blank spaces shall be filled. I want the ceramic oxides to be deposited exactly as per this template. That is what is templated growth. Uh, you see, <coughs> this really requires a ceramist to have very, very good knowledge of chemistry especially physical organic synthesis, physics absolutely and mathematics because yesterday when I was talking I referred to very very briefly on precursor growth of ceramics that is taking gases and then di dissociating it. It is very, it was very easy to write on the paper to say, hey, I can get silicon carbide, boron nitride, silicon carbide or silicon carbide, boron nitride, silicon nitride. Very easy to do. But the problem is the thermolysis of them follows kinetics which are different from each other, temperatures of operation which are different from each other. The beauty of templated growth is it is all from solution. It is water. At most, I will vary the pH a bit, temperature, no, the rest of the things are constant. It is not that silicon carbide, oh, okay, you have got silicon chloride, tetrachloride, and methane. Then you get silicon carbide. You have to take the hydrochloric acid out. The boron nitride, ah, this is the next material. Silicon nitride, another different combination of reactant gases, different temperatures. 
that's not what technology that won't take us far it is so capital intensive so unruly but if we had templates like this where we knew exactly this is where this will grow from solution and as i go on to this lecture you will see why it is very compelling for the molecules to properly self arrange them as they grow you see the case of nacre or the seashell mother of pearl i would say it's a seashell is rather a mother, mother of pearl rather it is an organic inorganic hybrid of calcium carbonate and an organic layer a protein that process of growth of this mother of pearl is called bio mineralization it can be divided into four steps one supramolecular preorganization here basically it is the construction of an organized reaction environment prior to uh, mineralization that is let me say prior to mineralization self assembly of closed lipid cages and vesicles this is the very first step the second step is interfacial molecular recognition here what we have is controlled nucleation of inorganic clusters this is what happens in the second step here the organic supramolecular systems provide a framework for assembly of the cage remember i use the term first nucleation has to occur then after nucleation the supramolecular molecular assembly has to occur so that the proper cage can be formed the third is vectorial regulation of crystallization this is assembly of the mineral phase through crystal growth assembly of mineral phase through crystal gro crystal growth and the termination 
so that You see, once I have got this templates given, I have to induce growth vertically. So, first comes this supramolecular mineralization prior to self assembly, then comes the interfacial molecular recognition where there is controlled nucleation of the inorganic clusters, and then then really is the assembly of the mineral phase, so that the textures and shapes can form. I showed you the example of the mother of pearl, but there are thousand other designs you may need. And step 1, 2, 3 are the very most important ones. If we are dealing in a, with a biological system, then the fourth step is cellular processing. If we are dealing with biological system, or implants. Cellular processing then comes in after the vertical regu regulation, the crystallization, the mineral phase is assembled properly, the texture shapes can form and if we are dealing with biological system, the cellular processing. Now, these are the four most important subdivisions of a textured growth. Now, let me take a particular case what we would like to, what do I mean by it? Let me draw a diagram to illustrate my point again. This is, for example, a, I'm talking of organic matrix with these ends up here, and I've just immersed it into an ionic solution. What is it that I want to happen? If I want the inorganic phase to deposit on the organic matrix phase or the template. This is the basically the template. What would I expect is I am deliberately taking time because this is something brand new you are going to study. 
if I redraw the organic matrix all over again, what I want what I want to happen is here that the plus charges settle down over here while the negative charges they stay in solution. These plus charges are bound because I have got the organic template in the solution which is forcing the adsorption of the cation on to this particular head which is negatively charged. If I wish to do a bit of thermodynamics with it, the principle what is the principle? The principle is that an organic matrix acts as a template for the growth of inorganic ions in a self assembly mode. If the corresponding activation del is delta G star, then delta G star is proportional to I will define all the parameters this. First of all, delta G star depends on degree of supersaturation. where this C L by C S is a ratio of concentration of precipitating ionic species in the solution of course all oh, and ionic concentration at equilibrium. The main role of the organic matrix or the template is to reduce the activation energy required for nucleation. That is the main role of the organic matrix or the organic template which I had shown in this paper so that they could nucleate here much more favorably. This basic principle of forcing nucleation is can be shown in say another diagram. I will use another diagram.
this is basically the preparation of ceramic films using organic self assembled monolayers. Uh, pattern self assembled mono layers uh, can be done via micro contact printing. Now, suppose we want to repeat or recreate the structure of necker or mother of pearl. How would we go about it? The CaCO3 has to deposit at the CaCO3 essential container of mother of pearl has to deposit at C double bond O OH sites. They will simply deposit at OOH sites uh, so that the calcite crystals can grow and form micro patterned surface. There is a huge amount of work of late and today materials like yttrium oxide, titanium dioxide, zirconium oxide, zirconium oxide, yttrium oxide, vanadium pentoxide, uh, both Fe two O three and Fe three O four, zinc oxide, tin dioxide, lead sulfide, cadmium sulfide, zinc sulfide. All of these materials have been self assembled using self assembly techniques. Now, for example, I would simply point out lead sulfide, cad, cad sulfide. These are two are the materials which are now being used in the solar cell farms where they convert solar energy to electricity in the solar farms in Europe. I had referred to it in the very early part of my lecture and I said I would come to self assembly and that is where I am today. Because they have a much higher output than the conventional silicon solar cells and today these lead sulphide, cadmium sulphide, cad telluride, mercury telluride mercury can telluride all of these solar cell materials are being deposited through self assembled mono layers. What does it offer? Like the structure the mother the pearl I have a stacked layer each layer hardly 10 to 20 angstrom thick. So, the sunlight can penetrate right through 
higher absorption efficiency, higher current generation and the, the and uh, since we are now doing it through self assembled monolayers, the extensive use of physical vapor deposition processes are avoided. In the next lecture, I shall talk of the techniques, some techniques of self assembled monolayer growth in ceramics. Have a great day.